I had just returned home after attending the Remembrance Sunday ceremony on 14th November when I heard of the absolutely horrifying news of Colonel Viplav Tripathi, commandant of 46 Assam Rifles, having been killed in the line of duty along with four other soldiers in an ambush by insurgents in Manipur. The PLA, along with the MNPF, claimed responsibility for the dastardly attack. Having had a ringside view of life in the armed forces, I learned to cope with such news very early on in life. However, what I wasn't prepared for was the news that the officer's wife and his little son, who were accompanying him, were also brutally murdered in the ambush. While the Revolutionary People's Front spokesperson claimed that the insurgents were unaware of Colonel Tripathi's family accompanying him, it is rather hard to believe. This is because such ambushes are planned and laid meticulously. In this case, the officer was returning from a forward border post that he had visited the previous day. The attack happened in the morning and information about the movement of the convoy would have consisted of very precise details of the strength of the target. Furthermore, the ambush was carried out at close range and even if the initial intel did not inform them of the officer's family traveling in the convoy, the attackers would have had ample opportunity to call off the attack once they would have visually sighted the target when it would have entered the so-called kill zone. We also know now that the pilot vehicle that was leading the convoy was attacked first and when it came to the CO's vehicle, he and the rest were shot at point-blank range. Further, the statement issued by the Revolutionary People's Front also expressed gratitude to the Kada who were involved in the planning and the execution of the attack. So much for being remorseful. This was not cricket. Even by the usual reprobate standards of the conduct of insurgency and counterinsurgency in the region. The local population openly condemned the incident and showed solidarity with the fallen soldiers and the murdered family of the colonel. At this point, I would like to pause and ask all my brothers and sisters from Manipur and from Nagaland, my Metis brothers and sisters and my Naga brothers and sisters, especially those of you who support the secession of these areas from India, who support these insurgents, I want to ask you to put your hand on your heart and tell me, is there any justification in your cause for this cold-blooded murder of a child and an innocent woman? On 4th December, just around sunset, the special forces of the Indian Army laid an ambush after receiving intel indicating the movement of insurgents through a particular road in the Tiru area of Mon district in Nagaland. A pickup truck carrying daily wage coal miners passed through the road and did not stop when signaled to by the army. The army started firing at the truck, causing the death of eight innocent civilians. Whilst this is no justification, I must highlight the context of how troops engaged in counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency operations have very clear rules of engagement based on thresholds being crossed and for a very good reason as we'll see in the next example. Just last year, in a similar case, a jihadist drove past the checkpoints in Pulwama, Kashmir after being signaled to stop. His car was fired upon by the forces and although he escaped, the car was found with an IED that used 20 kilograms of explosives. Coming back to Nagaland, the locals who witnessed the incident gathered in mobs and attacked the army with daos, local machete-like swords and stones, causing the death of one trooper and injuring seven others. The army fired back at the mob in self-defense, in turn causing the death of six more civilians. The army says that there was a major intel failure that led to this absolute debacle of an operation. I can fully understand the skepticism that some may have towards the army's explanation, given that this region has seen its fair share of excesses 
carried out by the security forces. There has been, and rightly so, a massive outcry in the nation after this incident, calling for justice for the innocent lives lost and to hold accountable those responsible for this tragic incident. At this point, I would like to take a pause and address all my fellow Indian countrymen, regardless of where you come from, whether you're Nagas, whether you're Métis, whether you come from Arunachal, whether you're Bengalis, whether you're Ahomia, whether you're uh, fr from Kerala, whether you're from Tamil Nadu, whether you're from Kashmir, you're from Gujarat, Delhi, whatever your political leaning is, whatever you think about the armed forces of India, whether you support them wholeheartedly the way I do, or you're absolutely against them, whether you love India or hate India, I want to ask you, can there be any justification for the killing of innocent daily wage laborers the way it happened in Nagaland? Can we say we condone such an incident? Or do we all want accountability? I for sure want to see those responsible for this being taken to task because I was definitely outraged by the loss of innocent lives of my fellow countrymen. Both these incidents seem to have set some precedents. The killing of the Assam Rifles officer's family was a red line crossed. Notwithstanding the odd case of collateral damage, both sides have always abided by a gentleman's agreement which now lays breached. If this is a sign of things to come, it surely doesn't bode well for the future of the region and definitely not for the future of India. On the other hand, after the killing of innocent civilians in Nagaland, the country, for the very first time, witnessed the security forces and the government own their mistake, saying they messed up. The contriteness was clear from the tone of the Home Minister, Mr. Amit Shah, as he addressed the parliament on the incident. Never in India's history has the government or the army done this. We have, in fact, sadly only seen the opposite happen once too often. This precedent of taking ownership and accountability is definitely something we can all say we want to see more of from our government. My association with the Northeast, and in particular with Nagaland, albeit indirect, goes back many decades. In fact, far before I was born. It goes back to the days when my grandfather, soon after Nagaland gained its statehood, served as one of the first chairman of Nagaland Public Service Commission. Now, he used to tell me stories about this stupendously beautiful frontier of India where lived these diverse yet lovely people. And he just couldn't stop speaking about them. I was really fascinated listening to his tales of this beautiful land. Sadly, this incident, this recent incident, only brings back bad memories. It has rightly revived the calls for discussing the repealing of one of India's most controversial laws, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, or AFSPA. Welcome to Sarvatra. How did it all begin? Well, as with most miseries that the world endures today, it all started with the British. In 1942, under the British Raj, the central government of India passed the Armed Forces Special Powers Ordinance to allow the use of the armed forces for quelling the Quit India movement. So, it is this British Raj vestige that has mutated into the AFSPA of today. Fun fact, this ordinance still exists by the very same name in Bangladesh. Ordinances inspired by the Armed Forces Special Powers Ordinance of 1942 were used soon after independence to stop the violence that resulted from the partition of India in 1947. Now, before we delve deeper into the historical background of the AFSPA, it behoves me to put this on record. Unlike some banana republics in India's close proximity, where the primary role of the army 
is to effect coups and oust the civilian government of the day, the Indian army is subservient to and is firmly under the control of the civilian government. Let's pause for a moment and let that sink in. India has the fourth largest military in the world, which is also considered one of the best trained, yet in its seven and a half something decades of existence as an independent country, it has never witnessed a coup. This is testament, not just to the professionalism of the Indian armed forces, but is also a statement of the robustness of democracy in India. With that stated and out of the way, let's get back to exploring how this law came about. Whilst construing the basis for laws in India, it is important to appreciate the unitary system of government that India has by virtue of the fact that India is a union of many states. There is a clear demarcation between the responsibilities of state governments and those of the central government. Article 355 of the Indian Constitution makes it incumbent on the Indian Union to protect the states from external aggression and internal disturbance. Now, that being said, law and order is a state subject. So, in 1955, when the government of Assam, remember Nagaland was a part of Assam then, couldn't put down the violence that emanated from the Naga insurgency, it enacted the Assam Disturbed Areas Act, which provided the legal framework for central paramilitary forces, in this case, the Assam Rifles, to aid the state law enforcement in maintaining order. Now, without such a framework, the Assam Rifles would have no legal authority to assist the state police. To make this clear, let me give you an example. A policeman from Karnataka is governed by the Indian Police Act of 1861 and by the Karnataka Police Act of 1963 wherein his duties and responsibilities are enumerated, such as the power to arrest, to carry out searches, to regulate traffic, etc, etc. However, an army officer whose unit may be based in Karnataka has no such powers. Coming back to Nagaland, when the Assam police, along with the assistance of the Assam rifles, failed to subdue the Naga rebellion, the Armed Forces Assam and Manipur Special Powers Ordinance was passed in 1958, which was replaced the very same year with the Armed Forces Assam and Manipur Special Powers Act of 1958, or AFSPA. This act allowed the center to use the armed forces to assist the state government's law enforcement agencies. After the territorial scope of the act was extended to include Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Tripura, Nagaland, and Mizoram, the act was renamed Armed Forces Special Powers Act of 1958. Similar acts were enacted to tackle militancy in Punjab and later in Jammu and Kashmir via the Armed Forces Punjab and Chandigarh Special Powers Act of 1983 and the Armed Forces Jammu and Kashmir Special Powers Act of 1990 respectively. The content of all these acts is very similar with minor logical changes made to address the peculiarities of the regions that they are applied in and the nature of the insurgency there. There is an entire industry that has been for many decades spreading this misinformation that the AFSPA grants the armed forces special powers to be trigger happy, to kill, to rape, to kidnap, and grants them immunity from prosecution for any human rights abuses that they may indulge in. This is patently false. I'm putting links in the description of this video to the text of the act so that you can read it firsthand. When you read it, you'll realize that the so-called special powers that the armed forces are given under this act are basically police-like powers that the armed forces otherwise don't have, along with immunity from prosecution to the extent and similar to that which police officers enjoy whilst performing their duty. Let's now briefly examine this anyway brief law. The law has six sections, which are as follows. Section one details the territorial scope of the law. Section two, 
provides definitions of relevant terms. Section 3. Now, this is the first of the contentious sections as it deals with how areas are designated as disturbed so that the act can then be applied to those areas. If the governor of the state where the law is being applied or in the case of a union territory, its administrator who usually is the lieutenant governor or the central government is of the opinion that the whole or any parts of the state or the union territory is and to quote the act in such a disturbed or dangerous condition that the use of armed forces in aid of civil power is necessary. Then the governor or the administrator of the state or the union territory or the central government can declare those regions to be disturbed areas. To summarize, the governor, lieutenant governor or the central government has to first declare the state or parts of it to be disturbed before the law can be applicable there. The use of the phrase in aid of civil power is noteworthy. It is not like martial law has been imposed. The civil administration is still in control. The armed forces only aid and help them. Now, some might find the usage of the phrase is of the opinion to be one that adds subjectivity and ambiguity to the law. Bad news. This is not the first or the last time that we would find laws across the English-speaking world being drafted so. Good news, it rarely allows for broad interpretation, especially in a democratic setup where the government is answerable to its people. This is also the case here. In 1997, the Naga People's Movement of Human Rights filed a writ petition to the Supreme Court of India questioning the constitutionality of this law. Long story short, the five-member bench, including the Chief Justice of India, quashed this contention and confirmed that the law was indeed constitutional. But what's important in the context of today's video's topic is that in the very same ruling, they also clarified, making relevant citations to the constitution, that the governor of the state or the administrator of the union territory or the central government do not have the arbitrary or unguided power conferred on them to declare an area disturbed. It further clarified that the government must periodically review the declaration at a period not exceeding six months before either extending it or revoking it. So the declaration of a disturbed area is not arbitrary and it is not indefinite and it is based on a constant review of the situation on the ground. Moving on to section four, it only gets more contentious. This defines these special powers. This section grants personnel of the armed forces serving in a disturbed area, the power to use force to maintain law and order to the extent of even shooting and killing an offender where necessary. It grants them the power to destroy ammunition dumps, hideouts, training camps, and other structures being used for illegal purposes. It grants them the power to arrest someone and do so even without a warrant if the offense committed or being committed is a cognizable offense. It grants them the power to search premises without a warrant to make arrests for cognizable offenses or to recover someone being held forcibly or to recover stolen property or to recover arms and ammunition. As you can see, every single so-called special power that has been granted to the armed forces under this act is something that the local police anyway enjoy. They are just simply powers that enable the armed forces to carry out policing duties. These powers are identical to what a police officer anywhere in the country has, regardless of whether the AFSPA is applicable in that region or not. My apologies, but you are going to hear me say this over and over again. I am going to repeat this again and again in the video, simply to drive home this point. These special powers are policing powers. Moving on. Section 5 requires a person arrested under the act to be handed over to the police with least possible delay along with a report 
detailing the arrest. This flies in the face of that widely circulated, widely propagated myth that under this act, the armed forces are allowed to kidnap and abduct people. The last section of the act, section six, is one that perhaps has been used the most to portray the law in bad light. The dominant myth surrounding this section is that it provides the armed forces with the power to act with absolute impunity, with no fear of and with full immunity from prosecution. Again, a blatant falsehood. All it takes is a very cursory glance at the very clear text of this act to tell you that yes, they can be prosecuted, but with the prior sanction of the central government. This so-called immunity is identical again to what police officers and other public servants, including the armed forces personnel, are granted under section 197 of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973. Such protection is necessary to ensure public servants can perform their duties without being dragged into one flimsy lawsuit after another. By now, it must be amply clear to even those of us who've got half a brain that this act is not a license to kill. It doesn't allow or grant the armed forces powers to kill, rape, abduct, be trigger happy. In fact, what it does is it acts as a legal bridge. It provides the armed forces the legal authority to carry out policing duties, an authority that the armed forces, due to their charter, otherwise do not have. By now, it would also be amply clear that this law has a reputation it simply doesn't deserve. The original British law enacted to quell the Quit India Movement protests, that is, the Armed Forces Special Powers Ordinance of 1942, by its very name, conveyed very clearly that it was a colonial law drafted with the intention of using force by a foreign power against the natives of a land who were to be subjugated by force. As my brother once said to me, if when naming the AFSPA had the great lawmakers of independent India use their independent thinking to come up with a better and less draconian sounding name that conveyed the true spirit of the AFSPA, say for example, Armed Forces Policing Powers Act or Armed Forces Civil Law Enforcement Act, etc., etc., instead of lazily naming it after a colonial era ordinance, would it have helped reduce the unfair criticism that this act receives many a time simply because of how its name sounds? One wonders. At this point, I must mention that apart from those media organizations that may have a bias against India, this law has been criticized even by the United Nations and by the Supreme Court of India. The Justice Jeevan Reddy Commission went so far as calling the act a symbol of hate, oppression and an instrument of high-handedness. The Santosh Hegre Commission constituted to probe the killing of six people in an encounter in Manipur is working at making the AFSPA more humane and the security forces more accountable. However, the same commission also dismissed the claim that the security forces lack any accountability under the law. Then what about the killing of the CEO of 46AR, along with his men and his family? What about the killing of the innocent coal miners in Nagaland? What about the many cases of alleged rapes, killings, and other human rights abuses purported to have been carried out under the auspices of this law? Firstly, as we have just seen, after having gone through the text of the law, there's nothing in the law itself that supports or condones such acts. Such acts, whether committed by the armed forces or by the insurgents are always extrajudicial. They have no place within the law. They are 
crimes, plain vanilla crimes. The AFSPAS being applicable or not being applicable has no bearing on these crimes being committed. Then why do these crimes happen? Why do they happen at a frequency much higher than in other parts of India? That is not because of the AFSPA. Whether the AFSPA was there or it wasn't there, these crimes would happen because these places are hot conflict zones. They are disturbed areas. There are ongoing conflicts in these areas. I must also set the record straight here. An overwhelming majority of the cases of human rights violations that were brought to fore have been found to be based on false allegations. But even a single allegation that proves to be true is bad enough to tarnish the image of the Indian Armed Forces. We can't just wish away actual cases such as the Malom massacre, which prompted Irom Shormila to start a decade and a half fast against the AFSPA, or the killing of Tangjam Manorama. A country shouldn't call itself civilized if its armies have to patrol its streets. This is especially so if they have continuously been doing so for decades. However, the Indian army doesn't go anywhere uninvited. If they have to patrol the streets, they need to be legally authorized to do so, and the AFSPA gives them that very legal authority. If the AFSPA must go, it must require the armed forces to go. After the Punjab militancy died down, AFSPA was revoked from the state. Even as recently as 2015, we have the example of how AFSPA was removed in a phased manner from Tripura after carrying out a risk assessment of every affected district. In fact, this is a fine example of India's unitary system at work, where the CPIM, which was in power in the state, and the BJP, which was in power at the center, despite being political opponents, worked things out amicably and successfully. Let's not forget the law and order problems faced in these areas stem from political conflicts that require political solutions, which in turn can only be provided by the civilian governments and not by the armed forces. The latter are peacekeepers, whilst the former are peacemakers. If our civilian governments have failed to make peace, they are squarely to blame. Yet, we find the armed forces going above and beyond their remit of simply maintaining peace towards winning hearts and minds with initiatives such as Op Sabhavna in Jammu and Kashmir and many similar ones in the Northeast carried out by the Assam Rifles. While India has done what any other civilized nation in need of deploying the armed forces to quell civil unrest and maintain law and order would do by enacting the AFSPA, there is no doubt that the law owing to all the bad press that it has unfairly received, harms India's image, especially internationally. I believe it has outlived its usefulness. When these conflicts began in India, the armed forces were the best equipped to handle counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, and the local police were woefully ill-equipped and untrained to do so. That has since changed, and the local armed police forces in the affected states along with the central paramilitary forces such as the CRPF are equipped, well-trained and mature enough to deal with such internal disturbances. The deployment of the CRPF's Cobra commandos to fight the Maoist insurgency in central India is a case in point. It is in India's overall interest to, in a phased manner, have the local police of the states where AFSPA is applied, relieve the armed forces of their responsibilities under the AFSPA, and, if required, take assistance from other central paramilitary forces, such as the CRPF or the BSF. The role of the armed forces should be an advisory one, to train the civilian and paramilitary forces and to provide them with intelligence. Concurrently, the civilian government and the civil administration should work towards a lasting resolution of the ongoing conflicts in the areas, as it was these very conflicts that necessitated the deployment of the army in the first place. I haven't even scratched the surface when it comes to discussing this very vast topic, 
And this is definitely not a video about the reason that these conflicts exist in these places or a historical background about these conflicts. I just thought that I would give you a starting point of sorts for you to do further research on the AFSPA. Do share with me your comments about what you think about the law, whether it should still exist, what we as a nation should do. I'm afraid that's all I have time for this time. I do, however, hope you found this video to be insightful. With that, I take your leave. Jai Hind.